going to be talking on, uh, touching on the topic of uh, staying connected, staying connected with those that we send. And I have a few different points that we'd like to touch on as we go uh, through this session. So I'll do just a quick who we are as word of truth. And I'd like to uh, touch some on teamwork and communication methods and then the ladder of needs and thinking of the ladder of needs as we stay connected and care for those that we send. So a little earlier here, just after lunch, it was uh, Earl Rissler and, and Matthew Wanger and I were, were standing there chatting a bit, and I just, I just said, I, I really think we'd probably be better served if we would ask all the missionaries here just to come up on the stage and line up and tell us as support groups and as senders what it is that we should do more of, what it is that we should do less of, and what we ought to just stop doing. But uh, we're going we're gonna to give it, give it our best. I, I did appreciate a statement that, that Earl Rissler made. He said, you know, as we think about senders and we think about our missionaries out on the field, he's like, we, 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 we should not forget about our missionaries' wives because they can be left alone and become very lonely at times. And I, I appreciated that. I think there's a lot. I think there's a lot that he said there. So uh, who we are, word of truth, um, there, there's, I just, I'll point to like three entities, as we would think of them as, that are working together closely, serving the Tarahumata Indians in uh, what I'll call the Copper Canyon regions of Mexico. So it's uh, uh, Elisha Baller and his family have been there for uh, quite a few years already. There's a what I would call a first-generation church there. That's the fruits of, of their labor, the, the work that the Lord had called them to. And through that then, there was this call for a Bible in the Tarahumata language. And so that's where Word of Truth and, and All Nations Bible Translation working together. So today we think of as these three entities working together on behalf of the Tarahumata folks. So there's a church there, and there's folks there that are... Um, are uh, going to be working at, are learning, working at learning the language, and eventually, Lord willing, they will have God's Word in their own language. So uh, just a quick introduction here. This is uh, our working board would be Jason Good. He serves as our Director of Community Development. We have Josh Weaver, who's here as well. He's uh, Director of Security. John David Hoover would be our Secretary. Adrian Note, our Treasurer. James Nolte, Vice Chairman, and myself as Chairman. Each, each one of us as board members has our kind of our own set or our own bucket of responsibilities that we each take responsibility for. Then we also have uh, some of our ministry that are very connected. So Wilmer Martin and Dennis Hurst are two ordained men from the Weaverland Conference that attend all of our meetings, and they, they will be there for, uh, for guidance for us and their ministerial support. And then... Uh, uh, David and Rosine Sensnick, their, their bishop, uh, Melvin Martin, and also uh, Pauline Hoover's bishop, Quinton Wanger, are two bishops that are very closely connected with the work and what we do there. And then for our missionaries, so David and Rosine Sensnick and their four children, David is working on the New Testament translation, and Pauline Hoover, who is the Old Testament uh, translator, there's Juanita Byler. She works with uh, orthography development and literacy. And uh, Juanita is Elisha Byler's daughter. So she, she's right there with, with Word of Truth at the same location. And she has been a, a tremendous asset uh, and, and a great support uh, to the work that is happening there. There's also Leona Hirschberger. She's just newly arrived, and she does what we would think of as domestic duties. She does the homeschooling for uh, David and Rosine's uh, children. And then Matthew and Laura Wenger and their seven children are just about ready to, uh, to launch and head south uh, for Mexico, and they will be focused on community uh, development. I just say that on this slide, it represents 16 people that we care deeply about. And it's, it's our goal to do the best that we can to uh, ensure that they are thriving and doing well in the work that God has called them to. So it's a group of people that we care deeply about. 
All right, so I'd like to move on now to teamwork. And I'll just say that as, as we go through the next three points, like teamwork, communication methods, the ladder of needs, we're, we are only going to be touching the, the tip of the iceberg, as we hear at times. So there's each one of these could be many sessions in and of themselves. I hope, though, that in some way you may be inspired in whatever area it is that you feel God calling you to grow in. And then take the next year and just work at that. Be intentional about growing in that area that you may feel that's uh, pressed upon your heart. So thinking of teamwork. Team, by the way, stands for together everyone achieves more. When we work together, there's more that can be accomplished. So our board and ministry team work together to do their job. Our missionary team is out on the field. They're working together to accomplish the things that they are there for. And when we think of this working together, this team working together, I have a little more of a mechanical mind. I think of these gears that uh, maybe in a gearbox, and each one of those gears has its specific thing that it's there for. These gears may be different sizes. They may rotate at different speeds. But all of that is immaterial. What's important is that each one is simply doing their part. If any one of those gears decides to change their speed or they decide to stop or whatever it is, it really throws everything else uh, into, uh, into chaos or trouble or distress or however you want to say that. So it's together that everyone accomplishes more. WTM has uh, six working board members, and each one of them has their own bucket of responsibility. And this has been a healthy arrangement for us. We have our director of community development. There's a director of security. There's a treasurer, secretary, vice chair, and chairman. Each one of these would have their own job description which explains the duties that uh, go with that bucket of responsibility. Everyone knows that. Everyone knows what's expected of that. And I'll just say that it, it, took, it took some time t for us to get to this place, several years, in fact, until it, it kind of settled in and we got, we got responsibilities that were kind of delegated to, uh, to the right folks and, and them uh, then taking that responsibility. So I uh, just, just want to make a point here that without, without defined responsibilities, without these buckets of responsibilities, without having someone be responsible, and if it's kind of this thing of, well, we're all responsible, the, the question really is, like, so who, who is responsible? And, and it, you can have this situation where it's, it ends up being nobody. And I'll tell you, nobody is a frustrating coworker. He's, he just doesn't get it done, right? So what, what can happen is, if there's not this uh, like delegated or defined responsibilities, you may have a, a few very generous people who end up doing the lion's share of the work, and others not very much. And what that ends up doing is it ends up limiting the progress. So it's, it's, uh, our recommendation is, is that, you, that you work at, at uh, yeah, delegating responsibilities. When, when a team member agrees to their bucket of responsibilities, they're agreeing to take that, to be responsible with it, to steward it, and, uh, and, and ultimately then be held accountable for that as well. Some time ago, I had a direct report in my, uh, where I work, and... And this, this was a, he was a fine man, he was, he was, he was easy to relate to, he, and all of that. And he was also very, very quick to say, yeah, I'll take care of that. But it didn't take me long until I realized that the chances of him actually doing it were far less than that. The chances of him actually doing it, uh, or not doing it, were far greater than, than him actually doing it. He would delegate it to his coworker, Mr. Nobody. And it, it, it was frustrating. It, it, causes, it causes chaos. 
We can read in Matthew 21, verses 28 to 31, but what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterwards he regretted it, and he went. Then he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the Father? So teamwork. I'll just say that our missionaries deserve working for a well-working, well-structured, well-run uh, group of supporters. Every member has a part to play. There's things to do and things to accomplish. And if, if any one of those members stops contributing, it has an impact. So our, our missionaries deserve a sending orga organization that is functioning well. I'd like to take a look at some communication methods here. So thinking of, of communicating in a way that brings effective challenge and development. So communicating in a way that brings effective challenge and development. So I read a report that was from uh, some type of a, a leadership development organization and they did a study on the effectiveness of different mediums of communication regarding communicating in a way that brings effective challenge and development. And so they, they gave like a, a percent of effectiveness for in-person, like person-to-person, -person, or in like video conferencing, phone call, or other electronic means such as email, text, and or social media. In their report, they indicated that face-to-face -face is about 95% effective. So when you can sit down face-to-face -face and, and communicate, that was around 95% uh, effective. When you went to uh, like video conferencing, they, they dropped that in at about 70%. So communicating in ways that bring effective challenge and development and I'll say that with video conferencing, especially one-on-one -on -one video conferencing, I feel can be very effective. It, it takes a little bit of practice, yet if both parties are committed to open and honest conversation, it can work really, really well. When it's a group of people, you can quickly start to lose uh, some of the effectiveness. But one-on-one -on -one can be uh, very effective. And the more, you, the more you do it, the more you learn to just uh, to make it more meaningful and helpful. One of my colleagues has said one time that, he said, you know, it's, it's not so much what you say, but it's what the other person thinks that you said that is most important. It's not so much what you say as what the other person thinks that you said. A phone call then, uh, you see in, their, in this study, the effectiveness of, of good communication really started to drop. This came in at like a 35%. And I, just yesterday, one of my, my colleagues was telling me that he had, he had an excavator lined up to come out and do some kind of a project on his property. And so they were discussing dates that this could happen. And he had mentioned a, a time frame. I think it was the end of June or, or something like that. And... So he said he was driving down the road, and this excavator said that, well, he, he'll have to see because um, that's, that's about the time him and his wife are expecting their trial. And he, he didn't know this man very well, and he thought, oh, no, he wonders, like, what, what, uh, what may be going on? Like, what, what would this trial uh, be about? And he, was, he said he was a little concerned. He was hoping there's not something unfortunate here, and Several weeks later, they're back on the phone, and they're going to be working at scheduling this time. And again, this, this window end of June, and he said, well, this excavator told me, he said, well, you remember that I, I told you that that's the time that my wife and I are expecting our child. And he said, you're expecting a child? Yeah, he said, I told you we're expecting a child, and that's about when the baby's due. And he's like, oh, okay. In his mind, he thought he had said a trial. 
He thought they were going to court, but it was very, very different. It's not so much what you say, but it's what the other person thinks that you said. When we get down into uh, the electronic communications, there's, um, uh, it, it drops, the effectiveness really drops for meaningful development type conversations. And uh, now I just want to say that all of these methods, all of these mediums of, of uh, communication, they do have their place. They really do. And, and I think what's, what's most important is that you just be aware of what it is that you're communicating and which medium will that be best. So if there's something that needs to be said in person, just do that. Or if it's going to be okay on video conference, fine. But don't, something that should be on video conference or in person is not really something uh, that I would recommend that you try uh, emailing or texting or, or something like that. So thinking of staying connected. So one of, one of, our, uh, one of the things that we're responsible for in our bucket of uh, responsibilities is to uh, stay connected, ensuring that our missionaries are doing well physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And we end up doing a lot of communication via Zoom. There's a lot of electronic uh, uh, video conferencing uh, type communication. We have a regular scheduled meetings. So I will meet monthly uh, as it works with our missionaries. I uh, will connect with our, like our board members uh, throughout the month as well on specific topics and things like that. We, we try to uh, stay connected with Aaron Kreider. Uh, like once a month or so when it works, we'll, we'll keep up a Zoom and just stay in touch. And, and I'll just say that I, I thank God for good internet connections. It allows us to, to just stay connected and relate in a way that I can't imagine how it would have been generations prior when they did not have uh, these uh, uh, technical abilities. And then when our missionaries are coming home for furlough or if we're going to the field, we, we try and make the most of those opportunities in those face-to-face -face interactions. And so, Lord willing, we're, my wife and I are planning to uh, go down to Mexico here end of August, and we're starting to uh, develop a list of things that we want to interact with face-to-face -face, uh, with our, our missionaries about. And we're also talking to our missionaries saying, hey, look, let's make the most of this time, so be doing the same. Like, what are those things that we need to talk about when we can sit down at the table and, and connect uh, in that method? So just, just an encouragement, choose your medium wisely in regards to what it is that, that you need to communicate. So now I'd like to go to the ladder of needs. So thinking of, thinking of uh, missionary care, the ladder of needs and missionary care. And again, some of, uh, some of the responsibilities in our, our bucket are physical, emotional, spiritual well-being. And for me to do this well, there are some things that I have to keep growing in. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not finished yet. I'd like to just name four of those, four areas of focus that I want to intentionally keep growing in. One of those is the skill of listening. The skill of listening. Another one is the skill of asking questions. The skill of listening, the skill of asking questions. The third one is the skill of feeling with others. The skill of feeling with others. So think of empathy and compassion and those, the skill of feeling with others. And then number four, the skill of speaking the truth in love the skill of speaking the truth in love. So I'd like to take a look at a missionary that we can read about in God's Word and see how it was that God cared for him during a very, very difficult time in his life and see if there's anything that we can learn from that example of how God took care of one of his missionaries that was going through a difficult time. And that's the, that's the story of Elijah. 
So in my mind, I picture Elijah as this mighty man of God. He went to King Ahab and he said, in the name of the Lord, it's not going to rain again until I come and tell you it will. And that's what happened. Of course, King Ahab wasn't very happy with that. And so the Lord directed Elijah to go hide by the brook Cherith. And the ravens came and fed him there until the brook dried up. You remember that story. And when the brook dried up, he was asked to go live with this widow and her son. And it was there that, that the flour and the oil did not get all, and it sustained them through this time of drought. You remember that story. Also, while, while Elijah was living there, this widow's son became sick and died. And Elijah, taking, taking this son and crying out to God, this son's life was restored to him. And isn't it amazing? The woman, this widow, said, Now, now by this I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. You know, just a little side note, we see these kinds of things from our missionaries just faithfully doing their work in the mission field. These kinds of amazing things, these miracles, I would call them, that show the folks that they're, that they're ministering to, that there really is a true God. So then Elijah goes, uh, the, the time came, and they had this, this Mount Carmel experience. They're up on the mountain. There's kind of this duel between who really is God, and, and they build the altars. I mean, you know the story. And so then, and then the, the fire came down, and they consumed the altar and, and everything there, and and following that, it tells us that Elisha executed the prophets of Baal. And, and then he went, he, started, he prayed for rain. And with time, this cloud started to form. And, and after a while, it was raining. Three years and six months later. And then we have this picture of, of, of Elijah's running down the mountain and, and all of that. I just picture Elijah as this mighty man of God. I'd like to read now 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through probably about 15. And just, just listen to this. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and also how he had executed the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, when he, Elijah, saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than any of my fathers. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and he drank, and he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank, and went on the strength of that forty days and forty nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then he said, Go out. Stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out, and he stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, God of hosts. 
Because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king over Syria. And he went on and gave him these, these different things. And, and then he concluded, he said, Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that hath not kissed him. So using this as an example, I would like to glean some, some ideas for how I think we can care for those that we are responsible for. Elijah was this amazing instrument in God's hands. And now here he was, laying under a tree, asking God just to let him die. He is all the picture of a missionary in despair. Just a question. Could this happen to one of our missionaries as well? You know, we may be here at home rejoicing because we hear all the wonderful things that God is doing through them. Amazing things, right? Yet they may only be one day from discouragement and despair. We see how it worked with Elijah. One day he's having the Mount Carmel experience. And the next day he's laying under this tree saying, Lord, just let me die. Let's take a look at how God cared for him. So thinking of the ladder of needs. So here, here, was, here was Elijah in despair. And I, I, in my mind, I see this starting with physical provision. So Elijah was down and out so much so that he wanted to die. And the Lord sent his angel. And his, this angel started by ministering to his physical well-being. Food and water rest. Food and water rest. Are our, our missionaries' physical needs being cared for? Do we, do we take that seriously? Or do we just somehow let them fend for themselves? Do we take care of our missionaries physically? Thinking of secure, so 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horb, the mountain of God, and there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. I believe he felt secure there. So Jezebel had threatened his life. He was, he was feeling threatened, and, and now here he is. He's, he's in the mountain somewhere. He's in this cave, and I believe feeling secure. Do our missionaries trust us to be there for them? Do we come through? Do we come through on their behalf? Do they feel secure and have confidence that we will do all that we can on their behalf. If they know without checking that their support group, their church, is solid and unchanging and is there for them, that brings them security. They're out on the battlefront, and there, there are probably many days when it feels anything but secure, but knowing that their support group, their church, is there for them, will bring security. If deep within them, they're wondering if you really care or if you really will be there for them when they need you, that's unsettling. Friendship. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Like six words. What are you doing here, Elijah? I believe it was a voice of care and compassion and friendship. What are you doing here, Elijah? I doubt that the voice was harsh, critical, and condemning, but caring and compassionate, the voice of friendship. Do we do our part with our missionaries? You know, I've heard from multiple missionaries that life Life on the mission field can be very, very lonely at times. Do they know that you and I, do they know us as, as caring people, people that they can trust and relate to and can count on? 
mental well-being, mental stability. Elijah asked, Elijah was asked, what are you doing here, Elijah? Which gave him then the opportunity to share his thoughts and kind of get it out, like get it off of his chest. I've, I've wondered already, what, what did that sound like? Was he crying? Was he, was he blubbering? Like, was he, you know, when a child may fall and, and it's, they come running for, to one of their parents, there's, sometimes it's hard to hear what they're saying and, and all of that. And I've wondered already, like, is that, was it like that in this case when Elijah answered, answered God? Like, what are you doing here, Elijah? I, I would think, though, that it was probably good for him mentally. And I just think about the skill of asking good questions. The skill of asking good questions. Do we ask our missionaries good questions? And then do they trust us enough to be open, sharing what's on their mind and hearts? Just the other week, I was on a Zoom call There were several of us on a Zoom call with a man who is going through an intensely difficult situation. Intensely difficult situation. And there was times when it was hard to hear what he was saying. He was was broken up. Do you know, it was good for him. It was good for him to have these, these listening ears. It didn't matter if we couldn't hear what he was saying, but he knew that our hearts were hearing. Thinking of emotional well-being, so being balanced and stable in our emotions. When we are, when we are thinking clearly, then with God's help, we can, help, we can balance our emotions with God's help. I think Elijah was a, was a bit of an emotional mess. I'm alone. I'm the only one that's left, and now they're seeking to take my life. I think it was a bit of an emotional mess. Think of the skill of feeling with others. And, and recognizing when they're really asking for help. So back to this man who, who we were uh, relating to in a, in, a, in a Zoom conference. There was one of the other men there that later when it was just some of us, support folks, he, he through his own tears, said, we need to stand with this man. He was feeling. He was feeling with others. He was adamant about the fact that this man needs our support, and even if there's no one else that's going to stand with him, it's our job to stand with him. He was feeling care, compassion. Do we feel with our missionaries? Spiritual well-being. You know, when we find Elijah under the tree wanting to die, he wasn't doing very well. And I believe that we can see the Lord helping him kind of regain his footing one step at a time. Like, what are you doing here, Elijah? I think it's important that we ask the right questions. What are you doing here, Elijah? And so it was when Elijah heard it, the still small voice, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out, stood in the entrance of the cave and suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? The still small voice. Elijah had been cared for to this point with food, water, rest, feeling secure. There was friendship. He was able to kind of clear himself mentally, emotionally, regain some stability. He was in communication with the Lord. And now he was ready to hear the still small voice. I believe that Elijah was ready to hear the truth spoken in love. I believe he was ready to hear the truth spoken in love. When he was laying under the broom tree, He wasn't ready to hear the truth spoken in love. We can see this process of him being cared for 
And I believe now he was ready to hear the truth spoken in love. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazel's. And, and he, gave, he gave him these instructions, speaking the truth in love, communicating in a way that brings effective challenge and development. I don't think it was critical, condemning, blaming, accusing, I think it was the truth spoken in love. And I would like to suggest that if, you know, if we aren't in a good place physically, we don't feel secure, we feel like we don't have any friends or, or we, we're mentally, emotionally not feeling very balanced, spiritually distant, we'll probably have a difficult time hearing God's still small voice. In Elijah's journey, there's a lot that happened before he had the still small voice encounter. Just think about that. Just think about the steps, one step at a time, him being cared for. And then he was ready to hear the truth spoken in love, the ladder of needs. Notice, notice what God wasn't in. There was a great strong wind that tore the mountains and broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. These mighty displays of power, we could say, storms, fire, earthquakes, things moving, shaking, burning. Yet we can, we can clearly read the Lord was not in that, but it was in the still small voice. Are there, are there these times that we are tempted to relate like the wind or the earthquake or the fire. Maybe just a little bit accusing, just a little bit of blaming, just a little bit of condemning, a little critical, negative. You fill in the blank. Are there those times when we're, we're tempted to relate like that? I'll just say that for myself, there is just so much that I can learn from this. Our identity in Jesus. So, so he, Elijah, departed from there and he went. The Lord gave him instructions and he went. I think he, he, he maybe kind of, he, maybe he refound himself, refound his passion or his vision or his purpose or whatever word you'd like to use. He, he, he again, he, he went to, he went, he was up and doing again. For the Lord. Does, does the way that I stay connected with those that, that, I, that I'm responsible and a part of sending, does it inspire them to pursue their identity in Christ? The skills that I need to keep growing in are the skill of listening, the skill of asking questions, the skill of feeling with others, and the skill of of speaking the truth in love. You know, the good Lord has work for each and every one of us. And Ephesians 2.10 would say that, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So in conclusion, have a well-organized team with defined responsibilities. Understand the level of effectiveness of the various different communication methods and make sure you're using the right medium for the right message, with the right message. And take the initiative to be a caring sender. So thank you. Thank you, Brother Roger. I just want to give a shout out for their team. I can attest to saying that they are demonstrating the things that Roger shared with us about here this afternoon. So thank you, WTM, for leading the way with that. You've done an excellent job. You've set a high standard, and we appreciate that. What are the questions or comments that any of you might have before we wrap up here? We have just a little bit of time yet. If anyone has a question, Roger's been involved in 
and helping to lead the WTM team for a number of years now. Some of you are just starting into support teams. Maybe you have a question for him about how this really functions on a practical level. We'll take time for any questions. If, if, there are, if there is someone that wants to ask a question, just flag your hand and we'll grab you a mic. If he's covered it so well that the questions are all answered, then we'll dismiss two minutes early, and that's fine as well. Back Good here, okay, do we have a mic for this brother back here? Well, good afternoon. Oh, right here. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. I, I work with many different mission organizations and people serving on the field, and as I sat here listening to you, I was like, wow, I want to serve under this organization. <laughs> I'm, I was very inspired. Thank you, and God bless you. Have any, has anybody on the team, uh, whether the sending or the, or the missionaries, have they ever felt that um, all this communicating is taking too much time? Um, has that ever become, become too much? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really good question. So in our easy communication age, that's a challenge. And, and our missionaries and the team have had to learn how to deal with that. And so... Um, there's like, as, as a board even, we, we try to make sure that like we'll, we'll take weeks of this brother and, and sister will, will take this week and share encouragements with them and then the next week we, we put a little bit of a schedule together so that we don't all happen to pick the same week and they're, they're over uh, communicated and then starve the next kind of thing. There's also the challenge like with family, friends, uh, church congregation and all of that where they have to learn to, um, to not be overwhelmed with that. And I know I've, I've talked with David about that already, and he said, you know, there, he, he has honed this discipline of if it's not like his direct support, if he doesn't have time, it just has to wait. And it, it, it seems kind of cruel and harsh if there's a friend from a faraway place that wants to connect and, and chat a bit. But if they're not careful, that's all they'll get done in a day's time. So on the calendar, you have the days you communicate virtually or some way. Do you have an agenda for those talks or do you just shoot from the hip? Or how do you like those talks? Are they um, always scheduled perfectly? Yeah, so uh, one of the, and I think many different people, they kind of figure out what works for them, right? So for myself, I have, I will throughout, if during the day I think of something that, oh, I should, I need to talk to Josh about this or whatever, I'll just make a note of that or, or to David or whoever, and I'll just, I'll keep, I'll keep that list, and then when we connect, uh, we'll, we'll uh, touch those points. But it's not like we'd send out an agenda in advance and that kind of thing. For our board meetings, those we uh, do agendas and minutes and, and all of that. Your group has a number of single women that you're, that you're sending, and I'm curious how you support them. How we support the women, if I heard correctly? Yes. The single women specifically. So, uh, yeah, good, good question. So uh, uh, when we think of connecting with them, my wife and I will do Zooms, like joint Zooms with them. And that's, uh, uh, that's how we work that.